You're listening to The Vint Podcast, bringing you expert interviews, alternative market insights, and exclusive access to the world of wine and spirits investing. Enjoy the show. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of The Vint Podcast. My name is Brady, joined not just by Billy Galanka, but also by Nick King, our CEO, for our quarter three update and report. Um, We sent out our formal quarter three report, but we're glad to bring you some audio content um, again with Nick here on the pod to just share some updates about Vint as a platform, about some of our milestones that we've met and changes on our team. Nick, it's good to have you. Great to be here, Brady. Um, Before we get into a little bit more about kind of what we've accomplished and some of the milestones over the last quarter, uh, uh, this as this podcast has been released. We also have a new collection on the platform, our Bordeaux Millennium Collection, which is uh, some top wines uh, from the last 20 years um, from Bordeaux. These are blue chip assets from one of the top performing regions over the last 20 years. And it's really great to have some back vintage wines that we can add to folks' portfolios that are really coming into peak of maturity. Billy, is that is that kind of how you classify this collection? Yeah, yeah, I think it's the perfect complement for the the Bordeaux EP collection at Empremer that's open right now. Um, they're all from the 2000 vintage, and it's some of the top first gross as well as a few right bank um, superstars. And for those who just don't know, just quickly, the 2000 vintage is one of the best in recent decades. Um, you know, there there was a slew of middle of the 2000s really good vintages recently. Um, it kind of let people to kind of forget how good the 2000 vintage really was. So it's a perfect combination of adding some of this middle vintage stuff on Primor. And now we have stuff that's about 20 years old that's really in its prime drinking window. And we'll continue to um, really draw collectors' attention as it continues to mature. Yeah. So if you're an investor interested in Bordeaux or really just starting out building your portfolio, having kind of a blend of those those Bordeaux futures, as well as some of these classic back vintage um, Bordeaux wines from the 2000s, it's, it's, I think, a really great place to start building a cornerstone. For sure. It's our first Bordeaux offering that's over 20 years old since um, our Bordeaux classics last year as well. So interesting. Nice. Nice. Very good. Well, um, just to get into a little bit broader of a Vint conversation, Nick, do you want to just give us maybe overview perspective of how quarter three went? Um, what kinds of things you're thinking about? Definitely. I believe last quarter I started off with saying uh, last quarter was the best quarter. Um, I'm going to start it off with exactly the same uh, sentiment that this quarter was the best quarter that we've we've had thus far. Um, we've had new team members join distributions um, all around feels like internally things are, are humming and we're, we're in a great place. The distributions on the collections, was that something that you expected? Like when we got into the start of this year, maybe think back to January, February, that we would have distribution so soon, or has that kind of just been us following the markets? What's kind of in your mindset, what was the strategy if there was one? Definitely. So from day one, we, I feel we've marketed this asset class very fairly that it's a medium to long-term investment guiding towards three to seven years in terms of an average hold period. Um, So when we launched the product May, 2021, we were looking out in that same type of window um, to realize our first distributions. One thing became pretty clear um, early on is that our business is set up to opportunistically exit. um, And if those opportunities present themselves, we should look to capitalize on them. So with these distributions, the Bowmore Cask and the California Collection, um, it was a good example of two different ways that we can exit. Um, So with the Bowmore cask, this was an inbound offer for this cask, um, which is really, really exciting that people are viewing our assets on the platform and the exclusivity around them and saying, well, I I really want this. I may be willing to pay a a premium to access this asset um, because it is 
so rare and has um, strong future investment potential. So we worked with a merchant who um, was looking to acquire this cask and people ask, uh, similar to Brady, like, well, is one year sort of how you plan on holding and exiting these assets? And I say, well, in this example, if someone's going to offer us um, a net return of 30% to investors, we're going to entertain that um, most of the time because those are really, really strong returns. Um, and then to contrast that offer against the the California collection, that was something where we were more proactive. We had seen over the last year and a few months, the underlying assets in the California collection had appreciated at about 11% uh, rate as per wine searcher pricing data. So because we had observed this um, appreciation and um, we had seen LiveX reports that the California market was strong um, in the secondary trade, we looked to go and exit um, these assets more proactively. And what I want to highlight about the California collection exit was we exited those assets for a net return of 17%. Those underlying assets as per um, comparable market data had only appreciated 11%. So when people think about what value does, does Vint provide in terms of a platform, not only do we get access to some of the best assets in the world at really, really advantageous pricing because we source a million dollars worth of wine and spirits at a time. We have commercial licenses um, to find opportunities um, to source assets at attractive pricing, but also we have sales channels that some collectors may not be able to utilize. Um, and we're currently set up with our own federal import, export, DC online retail license and intend to expand that side of the business um, to really eliminate any sort of end sale transaction fees. But contrasting that against the auction markets where you may pay 25% in terms of a, a seller's premium, and then the buyer may pay a 5 to 10% buyer's premium, 35% are really, really high transaction fees. And we avoid all of those. Yeah. No, I think you hit the nail on the head with, you know, we were able to see prices or offers for our collections that were above market value and well above market value in some cases. And I, I think that goes back to our team, um, you know, keeping tabs to your point on what current market value is. I think you made a good point earlier in another conversation we had about, you know, some financial portfolios have money managers and, and different folks overseeing them. Well, we have Adam and myself and the wine team, basically, especially Adam is one of the the best potential, you know, managers of these assets in the world. Um, so it's giving us the ability to kind of see these gains and recognize the opportunities when they're there. Um, and it's also the ability to, you know, you were saying, the, the Bowmore cast is recognized as a great investment opportunity. Well, we were offered well above market value for that asset. And we were able to capitalize on our initial thesis of it being a 28 or it was a 1998 cast that put it in to being 23 years old last year. It was 24 this year. Somebody's looking at it. It'll be 25 next year. There was that little catalyst that we've been kind of, we had baked in originally that we were able to kind of capitalize on and, and further achieve this value. So great points. It's a good example of, the the alpha that the platform and our managers of the assets are able to create and only expect that that alpha to expand allowing us to earn um greater and greater returns and, and speaking of our team that kind of makes that happen we added two new team members this quarter do you want to kind of provide your own little introduction to them and what you think you know continuing to now over the last one year's time double the vent team Absolutely. We set out to bring on another engineer, say three months ago, and the the engineering 
uh, software engineering market is is quite competitive. So we have had success in the past by, you know, we we sell an opportunity to build something. Um, I think everybody is drawn to that opportunity to go out and be early at a company that's building something really interesting and really uh, own your department and own the execution of uh, the creation of this product. So where that story really resonates is with engineers. And uh, you think about engineers at the fangs or these big companies like uh, Capital One, a lot of time the building has been done for the most part. There's a lot of maintaining that needs to be done because these networks and systems are are so large. Um, however, you know these these engineers they typically they're builders and they want to go out and build things. So we welcome Dylan Sykes to the team. He started about a month ago. He joined from Capital One um, and was a. He's a been great on the podcast, hire. by yes. the way. Yeah. Yep. Um, and he's based out of Richmond, Virginia, and he's focused on the back end um, of the the tech stack. So that was a great hire. Uh, a second hire that we made, he's very recent, not even publicly announced as I'm giving this interview. I'm sure it will be um, once it's released. But we were looking for someone on the content side of things and this was inspired by the mantra that if there is no owner it's just never going to get done as well as it could be done so right now jordan does the email marketing brady assists with that billy works on the thesis content brady runs the social content and there's not one singular owner of content creation and distribution so although I feel we do a pretty good job, everything that we do can get better. So we set out to find someone to own the the content side of things. And we recently hired David Butler. He's joining from Start Engine and his title is investment analyst. He's going to be doing everything from the marketing content that you all receive via email to distribution of big announcements on social to more financially driven content, say like a white paper, maybe uh, an exit case study or, or sales analysis to really go out and financialize this asset class. We talked to a number of um, people who are SOMs or who have had a career in the wine industry, but what we were really looking for is someone who can go out and create that content that's going to push this mission forward of creating a new asset class um, by financializing wine and spirits. So look out for more content, like I had mentioned, white papers, um, case studies, and it's it's only going to get better. Yeah. And I, I'll say we'll have um, David on to share a little bit more about himself, but he also has written for The Motley Fool and he really has a, a financial eye and understanding of um, general markets and finance, as well as kind of the wine space, which he also has passion and background for. Um, also, one last note on Dylan. I will say everybody does want to build and they're excited, but he did note when he came on, Nick, how persistent you were emailing him um, every every month or so until he would join. And he was like, I keep hearing about Nick's wine company. And I was like, it's so funny you remembered it as a wine company, whereas we're actually a finance company. And he's like, ah, I figured that out when I joined. But uh, <laughs> I always called it Nick's wine company. That's funny. I, I told him when I gave him some merch that you are now going to be viewed as the wine person in all rooms. Um, so you've got you've to gotta learn up. Yeah. No, he's reading, you know, he's checking out the um what we're drinking this weekend. I told him that's the good place to start. So great. Um, so we have two new team members just coming off the back of some distributions, um, which is a really big catalyst for us. What are the expectations and goals? Maybe you can share a few um as we head through quarter four and uh, look towards the end of the year. 
Definitely. So there will be some big announcements in Q4, um, but from a, a product side of things, each quarter we we set these things called OKRs, objectives and key results, which provide guidance as to the goals for the quarter. Um, the objectives are higher level um, and the key results underlie the objectives and should contribute towards the completion of those objectives. So one of the objectives relates to a common point that Brady shares with the team that we hear from our investors, and that's improving the the post-investment experience experience, providing investors with more information, more data uh, with regards to their portfolio. Um, That is a big focus of ours this quarter. Um, And it's something that we actually started last quarter on the the business side, the wine and business team has been working on um, establishing a GIPS compliant framework with regards to portfolio reporting. So um, that's something that is really viewed as best in class when it comes to um, the financial world. So the Chartered Financial Analyst uh, Program, the CFA program has this GIPS standard. And we've been working with a consultant to establish a handbook that should unlock better and better data and and information opportunities um, in a really transparent manner for investors and um, their their, um, respective portfolios. Um, In addition to- GIPS is Global Investment Performance Standards, is that right? That is correct. Okay. And in addition to that, one thing that you may have noticed is if you've bought shares Recently, in say the last five collections, we've uh, really streamlined that process. We're doing things to automatically generate the subscription agreements such that the process to buy shares is more and more smooth. We're going to continue to improve those processes and make sure that, you know, we eliminate any friction there might be to um, buy a share and a uh, or a series of shares and collections of wines and spirits. So um, I I fully expect this upcoming quarter Q4 to be a big quarter with um, big announcements that we'll make public um, in the coming months, Uh, potentially new team members. We feel really good with where the team's at right now. 12 of us, um, we're getting more and more pickup when it comes to press and conferences, L is speaking at the Adissa conference. I'm going to be speaking at a conference um, in November, a wealth management focused conference. Um, and I would imagine when I'm giving this interview uh, in early January, I'm going to say Q4 was the best quarter we've had. And that's thanks to the really good team that we've put together. Yeah, I will say the not only we're, like we're, you, to your point, we're going to these conferences, but we're being invited to come speak and be on panels, and and it's kind of interesting. And they're they're not they're well beyond you know just wine focused events. These are fintech panels. These are you know the future of kind of asset classes and investing. So it, it's nice to be looped in on that. Whereas in the past, you know maybe we went to like Vin Expo, and that was you know where we were. But we're definitely financializing the asset class and and moving more that way. So it's great to be invited. Absolutely. And quick tangent on why I think that is like the broader economic environment is, is challenging to say the least. Um, One thing that I've been saying internally a lot is that we could be one of the only places where people are making money right now with our distributions. Markets across the board, whether it's the equities market, bond market, crypto, they're getting absolutely hammered. And we were looking at year-to-date returns and with Vince distributions, our average net return is 28%. The S&P is down over 20%. That is absolutely incredible. And it, it it's not 
it's not um, anomalous. I think people are looking for these real assets in these inflationary times. And I've read more and more recently the 60-40 portfolio that financial advisors have been selling for the past few decades is really being called into question. KKR, who's a big investment firm, just came out with a piece recommending a 40-30-30 portfolio, 40% stocks, 30% bonds, 30% alternatives. They think those alternatives offer a really interesting risk reward when it comes to portfolio construction. Goldman Sachs just came out with a piece. um, I believe it was titled, Is the 60-40 Portfolio Dead? And they were elaborating on some of the same things that KKR was talking about. Morgan Stanley, BlackRock, all of these people are writing about how the traditional 60-40 portfolio, sure, it worked in the past, but it might not work in the future because um, these these times are really uncertain. So um, we're, we're in an interesting time. I think this type of environment could be one in which it pulls forward the adoption of alternative assets, and we continue to see really really strong growth. Yeah. I mean, when we, we talk to investors all the time who are, uh, like you said, interested in the tangibility, they understand the value proposition. They understand why these real assets, especially in the alternative space where maybe um, uh, watches and handbags and luxury assets that you can put your hands on. People just understand, I think a little bit better, even sometimes, um, better than equities, how price movement happens, right? Um, especially in these up-down periods, we had this crazy run of the last couple of years during the COVID times, and now everything feels like it's crashing down. A lot of uncertainty, um, a lot of misunderstanding, and I think a lot of probably false assumptions that we had over the last three years. And running to a space where people could wrap their, wrap their minds around why an asset might appreciate, like wine, I think very simple supply-demand. Um, uh, curve, right? Like it makes a lot of sense for people. Um, I, yeah, I think that the tangibility of the asset is, is really important this time. Absolutely. Um, I was on call this morning and they're like, uh, sell me on wine versus other asset classes. I said, it just makes sense. Supply goes down, people <laughs> drink it. There's no, no more of the uh, 78 year old McAllen that sold out in 15 minutes. There's no more of that being being produced, it's only decreasing in supply. Um, and then you think about casks and wine that are improving with age, demand increases, it makes sense. So um, yeah, we're, we're definitely just getting started, expecting a lot of growth um, in this upcoming quarter and the upcoming year. So thanks for having me on Brady and Billy, and I will be back January. Yeah. Well, before we let you go, I'll say um, also, Pre-congratulations. The other big announcement for this upcoming quarter is Nick's getting married. So uh, big day for the big guy. I am. <laughs> Thank you, Billy. Yeah, congratulations. Thanks for coming on, Nick. All right. And that was our interview with our CEO, Nick King. Just a couple of reminders before heading out. We have our Bordeaux Millennium Collection launching on October 12th at 12 Eastern, 9 Pacific time. So that should be live or about to be live by the time you're listening to this. Um, Additionally, if you would like more insights or our perspective on the Q3 performance of the wine market, wine and spirits market as a whole, uh, we will link to our Q3 report in the show notes for this episode. So thank you again for listening and we will talk to you again next week. Cheers. To check out our current offerings and to sign up for the Vint platform, find us at www.vint.co. That's www.vint.co. For questions, comments, or feedback on the Vint podcast, please email us at support at vint.co. Vint and VV Markets are offering securities pursuant to Regulation A. Our offering circular is amended can be found on the SEC website. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. Investments such as those on the Vint platform are speculative and involve substantial risks to consider before investing. We may provide communication that may contain certain forward-looking statements that are subject to various risks and uncertainties. 
Information provided in any communications, including this podcast, is not legal, business, or tax advice. All prospective investors should consult a legal, tax, or business advisor concerning the subject matter of any communications and any offering.